Good morning, everybody. Do you hear me? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to be a chair of this morning session. And let me present the first speaker today, Anna Irina Nistor. She is a researcher in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science in the Technical Univers University of Yashi. She is working in the field of differential geometry and she has defended her PhD thesis in the Catholic University in Leuven under the supervision of Frankie Dillon. Her talk today is on magnetic trajectories on almost contact metric manifolds. Anna, you have the floor. You have to switch on your micro microphone. Thank you. Okay. I'm not totally used with the <clears throat> online presentations. Uh, so I apologize if I make some mistakes, some technical mistakes. Um, as I said, uh, thank you so much for giving me the chance to give a talk in this uh, seminar. Professor uh, And uh, I... Uh, Try to make it work. Okay. It's okay now. Yes, yeah. we can see the presentation. So I will talk today about uh, magnetic trajectories on um, almost contact metric manifolds. <coughs> the content of the talk is as follows. In the first part. Uh, I will present some uh, preliminary notions like uh, what is a magnetic trajectory, what does it mean almost contact metric manifolds, uh, and what are slant curves. The second part of the talk consists in the, some uh, classification results of um, uh, magnetic curves or magnetic trajectories <coughs> in different ambient spaces like Sasakian manifolds, co-symplectic manifolds, quasi-Sasakian manifolds, and um, for the um, third section, I will um, give some um, more details for the ambient spaces like uh, S3 cross S2, the generalized Heisenberg group, or um, <coughs> the three-dimensional uh, quasi-Sasakian manifolds. Uh, the first steps in the study of magnetic trajectories were uh, done in the um, classical treatment of uh, static magnetic fields in uh, Euclidean free space. The first results we know were obtained for magnetic fields on Riemannian manifolds. So what is first uh, magnetic field? If we have a Riemannian manifold M endowed with the metric G, uh, then a close to form F, it is called a magnetic field. So in a magnetic background uh, defined by the Riemannian manifold M, metric G, and the magnetic field F, the Lorentz force is the skew-symmetric uh, one-on type tensor field satisfying the relation one. This one here. Uh, what is a magnetic curve or a trajectory? <coughs> so um, a trajectory generated by the magnetic field F uh, is defined uh, as a smooth curve gamma, which fulfills the Lorentz equation or uh, Newton equation given by equation two. So nabla gamma dot gamma dot equals the Lorentz force phi along the curve gamma. Here nabla denotes the levi civita connection associated to the metric G. Um, as the problem comes from physics, in a physical interpretation, the magnetic trajectory gamma describes the trajectory of a charged particle under the action of a magnetic field F in the magnetic background MJF. Uh, as I said in the beginning, um, the Lorentz box is a skew symmetric one on type tensor field. So this skew symmetry of the Lorentz force yields a basic property of magnetic curves, namely, uh, it's the conservation law saying that uh, particles evolve with constant speed, so also with constant energy, along these uh, magnetic trajectories. <coughs> Moreover, uh, a magnetic curve is called normal 
if it has unity energy. So the norm of um, gamma prime equals one. Uh, what can we say about uh, magnetic trajectories um, and uh, geodesics? Um, <clears throat> so, um, if the magnetic field is absent, equals zero, there is no action, then the magnetic curves correspond to geodesics in uh, the Riemannian manifold M in W-metric G. As we know, geodesics are uh, characterized as critical points of an energy action. So they represent trajectories for um, free-fall particles. So when there is no magnetic field involved. Moreover, magnetic curves on the magnetic background MJF can be also viewed as a solution of um, a variational principle. Uh, the existence and the uniqueness of geodesics remain also true, valid, also for magnetic trajectories. Some examples of magnetic fields are as follows. In dimension two, uh, any multiple of the area element. And here we will give more details. Uh, then um, on uh, Keller manifolds, we have the Keller form. And on um, some other ambient spaces we are interested today, like Sasakian, Cosiplectic, and Cosisasakian manifolds, the magnetic fields are given by the um, fundamental to form. And we will see exactly in the following. <coughs> so on, my, on dimension two, as I said before, uh, the problem of finding the magnetic curves, uh, it's called the landau hall problem and also comes from physics. On a surface of revolution, the problem was solved um, by uh, Barros together with Cabrez, Fernandez and Romero a paper published in 2005, when they studied the motion of a charged particle in the presence of a static magnetic field, no electricity involved, as I said in the beginning. And uh, later on, uh, the problem was uh, solved also on canal surfaces by uh, Montano. So more precisely, if we have M, an oriented surface, we denote by the sigma, the area element. And as we said, any magnetic field on the surface M is determined from a small fraction F, which will be called the strength, multiplied by the area element. If we have uh, the function F, the strength constant, then a parallel magnetic field F, so a magnetic field with constant strength, it is called an uniform magnetic field. And the basic uh, result given by uh, Barros and uh, his collaborators in the paper I mentioned before is the following. So if we have a Riemannian surface M in our metric G, uh, and we consider an um, uniform magnetic field F given by Q multiplied by um, area element, then a curve gamma with constant velocity V, so also constant energy, is a magnetic curve on, of the magnetic background MJF if and only if it has constant curvature Q over V. Q over V. So, what does it want to say, this proposition? It wants to say the following, as the, the author say, namely that the, the geodesic partner of the Landau Hall problem on surfaces for uniform magnetic fields, so when the strength is constant, is nothing but the computation of curves with constant curvature. Uh, what happens on the Euclidean two plane? Uh, the magnetic curves are just circles with a radius one over the uh, modulus of the strength. On the two sphere, uh, there are um, small small circles with a precise uh, radius here. Yeah. 
in the hyperbolic plane, the situation is quite different. So, um, uh, the flow lines were described by uh, Comtet in 1987 when he considered the upper half plane model for the hyperbolic plane and uh, he obtained that the magnetic trajectories uh, are given on one side by um, geodesic circles, so they are closed curves on one side, and on the other side, on the other restrictions, there are non closed curves on the upper half plane. In particular, they have tangent to the boundary and they are horocycles. Well, um, Riemannian manifolds of uh, dimension three are uh, of particular interest because, uh, as we said, <coughs> the magnetic fields are defined by the um, uh, closed uh, two forms. So it is known that uh, on a three dimensional Riemannian manifold, two forms and vector fields may be identified uh, using the Hochstar operator and the volume four of the manifold. So magnetic field, which meant that uh, uh, the two form is closed, uh, means that uh, uh, magnetic field means just divergence free vector fields. So if we have a divergence free vector field, it defines a magnetic field. Um, a particular class of uh, magnetic fields is defined by the killing vector fields. And they are, they are uh, uh, called killing magnetic fields. Here we have the relation that must be satisfied by a killing vector field. And as I said, they have divergence zero. So they define magnetic fields. Even more, uh, we can define the cross product on, um, on a Riemannian three manifold. So the cross product is defined in the following manner. Here we have the volume four. If V is a killing vector field on M, then FV defined like this will be the corresponding killing magnetic field. So a killing vector field will define a killing magnetic field. The Lorentz force will have then this expression involving the um, uh, usual cross product in, uh, in the ambient space. So the Lorentz equation that we should solve can be written in this manner, nabla gamma prime gamma prime equals V cross gamma prime. Um, if um, we try to, to write a bit here, if moreover we, we will add um, the strength here, if I add also Q, I, uh, I, I try to solve this Lorentz equation, so to find the curves gamma in the ambient space E3. So if, uh, if I regard it as uh, we know, E3, uh, which is R3 together with the scalar product. So in this ambient space, uh, the, the, easiest, the easiest example is given by the killing vector field V, uh, which is uh, zero, zero, one. So along the vertical axis on set. I'll have x, y, z. Yeah. So this straight will be v. Good. Uh, we don't solve it here, the equation. It's already solved. We just show the solution. We stop this one and we will open. An, um, Mathematica file. Wait. The Mathematica file. Is this one? OK. 
Okay. Um, you don't see it anymore, I think. Oh, yes. So here um, is just um, <coughs> um, uh, the equation, the Lorentz equation is just a second order uh, equation. So you need the initial conditions for uh, gamma in zero and gamma prime in zero. More here, the solutions. Yeah, if gamma has the coordinates x, y, z, you solve the system of equations and you get these solutions x, y, and z, where you have the initial conditions, and here the notations for omega and r are made depending on the strength q. To see exactly what happens, we will take some values. So we will take R1, we will start with omega zero. Omega is basically minus the strength. So if I have no strength in E3, I'll give it zero there. V3 is the, um, the third component of the speed. And these are the initial conditions. So what happens first? I see that the third component of the speed is one. I check also the solutions. Here I'll have the curve. And here it shows me the first derivative of the curve. Yes, it's the, the tangent vector. The last component is one. I notice that the tangent vector, I wrote it here somewhere, um, it's exactly parallel with um, the killing vector field I took. I said that I take the vertical axis. So when I plot, I take a straight line. So it's it's just um, we get a straight line in the same direction with the um, with the killing uh, vector field V. Yeah. Then if omega is one over R, do it again. What we notice here, so the, the, the third um, the component here is zero, so it should be something in the plane. We will see now. These are the components. This is the curve. Here is the, the, the tangent. So if I plot the curve, it's almost obvious what I get. I get a circle in, um, in the horizontal plane, in the horizontal plane uh, x, y. Yeah, this is the circle I get. Here, vertical should be the, the magnetic. So these are the limit cases. <coughs> if I take some other, like, other value there, different from those in the previous, I have some value there, different from zero, different from one. These are the components of the curve. This is the curve. This is the um, tangent uh, vector. I plot and I get a helix. It's a helix, it's, it's, a, it's a helix with axis given by V. Yeah, given by the killing vector field, zero, zero, one. So, it's okay. Uh, for more details, we, we included here um, three references consisting in the study of magnetic curves in Euclidean three space. It's a collaboration of uh, one of my colleagues, Simona, and uh, Maria Montano. Then um, magnetic curves given by killing uh, magnetic uh, fields in S2 cross R and in H to cross R. Um, another notion that we will use in the following is the notion of, of uh, Frenet curve. So according to um, uh, Blair, 
Акаф Гана. Is it shared now? Yes, your screen is shared now. Thank you so much. Um, I said that, uh, but I won't change anymore. <laughs> we'll stay here. It's safe. So I have a phrenic curve. What does it mean a phrenic curve of osculating order R? Um, if I have an orthonormal frame of dimension R along gamma, given like this, such that relations three are satisfied, then gamma it's called the Freni curve of order of osculating order. Ah. Kappa one, kappa two, two, kappa r minus one are um, positive functions. And they are called the curvatures of gamma, the first curvature, the second curvature, and so on. Uh, motivation uh, to study basically the um, magnetic uh, curves in these ambient spaces came from the fact that uh, some results were obtained first for Keller manifolds. And um, according to Professor Blair's PhD thesis, he says that uh, Sasakian manifolds have often been called uh, the odd dimensional analogs of Keller manifolds. But uh, if uh, we have a Keller manifold and we take the, the, the product with R, then this new manifold we obtain can be considered an odd dimensional analog. Only that it carries a natural cos symplectic structure. <clears throat> so, in a certain sense, the quasi Sasakian manifolds are um, a better analogs of Keller manifolds. Uh, before giving the, um, the classifications results we obtained in these ambient spaces, we should explain a little bit the notions of Sasaki and Keller quasi Sasaki and manifold. Uh, without giving too much details, as the audience is from mathematics, not only from differential geometry, if I have a differential manifold M, uh, is said to have an almost contact metric structure phi xi eta g, and all these are described. So a field phi of endomorphisms of tangent spaces, a vector field xi, a one from eta and the metric g, if these relations are satisfied. <coughs> the metric, the Riemannian metric g, we say that it is compatible with the structure if this relation takes place. Um, on an almost contact metric structure. Um, the fundamental to four is defined by the two four omega given by four in this manner. So omega of x, y equals the metric of phi x, y. An almost contact metric manifold is said to be normal if the normality tensor equals zero, and here n phi is the non-point tensor. So if we combine what we defined, we say that a normal almost contact metric manifold with omega closed, with the two fundamental form closed, is called a quasi sasakian manifold. So this will be of interest for us. If um, the fundamental to form omega equals theta, then the manifold is called the contact metric manifold. A contact metric manifold, which is normal, is called a Sasakian manifold. A normal, almost contact metric manifold with both eta and the fundamental to form closed defines a cosymplectic manifold. 
So according to Professor Blair, PhD thesis, these types of quasi-Sasakian manifolds uh, range from the case of co-symplectic manifolds, when they have minimum rank one, to the case of contact manifolds when they have maximum rank. Uh, what is a Keller manifold? So if we have an uh, almost complex manifold B of dimension to K endowed with an almost complex structure J and a Riemannian, ma Riemannian matrix GB such that this relation holds, then the almost complex manifold is called an almost Hermitian manifold. If the non hoist tensor of the, of the structure J vanishes, then the manifold becomes Hermitian. A Hermitian manifold with close fundamental to form defined in the following manner, is called a Keller manifold. And this fundamental to form, called also the Keller form, defines the uh, Keller uh, magnetic field that I said in the beginning as an um, example of a magnetic field. One class of uh, quasi-Sasakian manifolds are the quasi-Sasakian manifolds of product type. Uh, so, locally, a quasi-Sasakian manifold can be written as a product of a Sasakian and a Keller manifold. We will see later in the classification results that we will take a Sasakian manifold N of 2p plus 1 dimension and a Keller manifold B. We take the product and the product manifold and it will be endowed with a quasi-Sasakian structure defined by four in this manner. Yeah, so an example of quasi Sasakian manifolds. Another notion that we will um, use, you will hear a lot in the classification, in the second part, in the classification results, are slant curves. So if I have an almost contact metric manifold M um, and the curve um, gamma parameterized by the arc length S, then the contact angle of gamma is defined as the angle theta, which will always be called theta, made by gamma with the trajectories of xi, vector field xi. The curve gamma is said to be a slant curve if this angle theta, if the contact angle is constant. In particular, if the contact angle is precisely pi over 2, then the slant curves are called Legendre curves or uh, almost contact curves. We use the term Legendre. Legendre. Okay, to talk about uh, magnetic curves uh, or magnetic trajectories, we need magnetic fields. <clears throat> so if I have a contact metric manifold, I can define a magnetic field in this manner. It's just a multiple of the um, closed fundamental to four. Here Q is a real constant, which is called the strength of the contact magnetic field F. Usually we assume that the strength is different from zero. We don't want to find geophysics step. The Lorentz force associated to the contact magnetic field F has this expression, Q phi. Phi is from the structure. Q is the strength constant. So the Lorentz equation becomes, in this case, expression five. Okay, this is what you have to solve in order to find the, um, the magnetic uh, curves gamma on a contact metric manifold. And now we we pass to the um, <coughs> second part of the talk. Uh, dealing with the classification results of what we really obtained in the study of magnetic curves. Um, first, what happens in Sasakian manifolds? 
uh, by definition, a Sasakian manifold is a quasi Sasakian manifold of rank of maximum rank. So that I mentioned, two n plus one. Uh, the result we focus on it is that um, the magnetic curves associated to the contact magnetic field defined by the fundamental two form of a Sasakian manifold have maximum order three. We remember, we try to keep in mind for later use. The, the concrete classification, which are the magnetic curves in a Sasakian manifold of arbitrary dimension, they are geodesics obtained as integral curves of psi. They are uh, circles, more precisely, non geodesic phi circles of a certain curvature, <coughs> depending on the strength, and of constant contact angle, again, depending on Q. They are also uh, Legendre, Legendre curves, Legendre phi curves with curvatures kappa 1 and kappa 2. And they have also phi helices, helices of order 3 with axis psi, with having the curvature kappa 1 and kappa 2. Yeah, these two are constant. That's why we can say that it's a helix. helix. For Kellogg manifolds, as I said before, the study started some time ago, 1995, with uh, Professor Adachi papers, uh, then uh, Comte and Kalin. Uh, they intensively studied magnetic curves in Kellogg manifolds. And what, um, what we recall uh, is that, among other results, it was shown that these magnetic curves are circles. So they have maximum of the two. So, second, three. Uh, character. What happens in cosymplectic manifolds? Well, cosymplectic manifolds are just quasi second manifolds of rank one. We studied them in, with the same co authors as in the Sasakian uh, paper with Simona, uh, Professor Xenoguchi and Tano, and we obtain again the geodesics. As integral curves of psi, uh, Legendre, Sar Le Legendre circles, <coughs> constant curvature here, and helices of order three. Here are also given the curvatures kappa one and kappa two. Of course, if it is a helix of order three, kappa three is zero, and no, we have no more. Okay. Uh, Magnetic curves in quasi Sasakian manifolds of product type. Yeah, so I said about Sasakian, I said about Keller. What happens if uh, we put together in a product manifold a Sasakian and a Keller manifold? We get a quasi Sasakian manifold endowed with the structure I showed in the previous slides. Here, the closed fundamental to form omega defines indeed a contact magnetic field given by six. This a multiple, it's just a simple multiple of the fundamental to four. This is the strength, the Lorentz force, again, as we see in the beginning. Uh, the curve, gamma, which we want to study, it has two components. The first component of the curve, gamma, comes from the Sasakian part of the product manifold, and the second from the Keller. <coughs> part. So, gamma is a normal magnetic curve if and only if it satisfies the Lorentz equation given in this form. As a consequence of uh, the Lorentz equation, <coughs> If we have gamma, a magnetic curve on the quasi Sasakian manifold and cross B, then the two projection curves on the Sasakian, respectively on the Keller manifold, are magnetic curves independently on the two manifolds. 
the results we obtain concerning the, the order is the following. So the magnetic curves corresponding to the contact magnetic field defined by the fundamental 2-4 in a quasi-Sasakian manifold of product type of arbitrary dimension, the ambient space, these magnetic curves have maximum order five. Uh, we said that in a Sasakian manifold, the magnetic curves have order maximum order three and on a Kellogg maximum order two. Um, it's not like uh, uh, three plus two uh, is uh, five because um, we would like to say that in, uh, <coughs> the, the quasi Sasakian structure plays a very important role in the problem because if you have in general um, two uh, Riemannian manifolds, you take the product space M1 cross, uh, uh, cross M2, then the curve gamma given by gamma one from M2 and gamma two from uh, M1 and gamma two from M2 such that uh, gamma one is magnetic in M1 with order R1 and gamma two is magnetic in M2 with order R2, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that the, 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 the curve gamma has order, has order R1 plus R2. It's, it, this is not true. And in our paper, we, we gave also some examples sustaining this. So. So it's, it's important, the, um, the, the, the role of the quasi-Sasakian structure. Uh, moreover, uh, the curvatures. So to have order 5, we have um, kappa 5, 0. But before, kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 3, kappa 4 are constant curvatures. <coughs> Uh, in the in the three-dimensional uh, quasi-Sasakian manifolds, uh, the second curvature is not in general a constant. So the first curvature is always constant, but the second curvature is constant if and only if the fundamental function of the quasi-Sasakian manifold is constant. So if we have only alpha-Sasakian manifolds or cosimplectic manifolds. <coughs> Moreover, we show that the uh, normal contact magnetic curve in Sasakian manifolds uh, is slant. So the contact angle is constant, as we said. A similar result can be proven for uh, magnetic curves in the product uh, N cross B. So uh, normal contact magnetic curve gamma in the quasi-Sasakian manifold N cross B is a slant curve. An example, so if we take S3 cross S2, it can be shown that the product space S3 cross S2 can be endowed with a quasi-Sasakian structure. Yes? Can be endowed with a quasi-Sasakian structure without giving more technical details. So I have a curve gamma on S3 cross S2. It has two components, X and V. <coughs> they are parameterized by arc length. We have the tangent vector, gamma dot, which is unitary. So we have this expression. Well, what does it mean exactly to, to find the magnetic curves gamma in this ambient space? You just take the, you compute the levi Vita connection, nabla gamma dot gamma dot, what does it mean? Then you compute the right hand side of the Lorentz equation in this manner. You put them together. Yeah? So from the Lorentz equation, you should solve this system. Yeah, a system of ODEs <coughs> to find the, the, the components to explicitly find gamma. Well, there are here also technical details, really long computations that in the end take you to find that in particular we have uh, these curves. So 
uh, normal magnetic curve in a point of S2. Then <coughs> things are getting more complicated and more. <coughs> there is a circle and then the components <coughs> which appear involve like um, trigonometric functions but expressions more uh, more complicated where we have also the strength um, or uh, the the contact angle and so on but anyway the explicit parametrizations can be obtained so we, we we can really say that if you want to see them exactly these are gamma xv is x this was v the v component and x component there are two cases Uh, another interesting problem in S3 cross S2 we wanted to solve it was the periodicity, property. Um, <coughs> so for, um, for the unit three sphere, the periodic uh, uh, property for uh, closed trajectories was done in uh, a paper of Cabral Rizzo and his collaborators. These results were, um, I said this is three dimensional, yeah. These results were generalized by Noguchi and Muntianu in the study of periodic magnetic curves in Berger spheres. And it is known that in physics, the, the periodicity condition is often known as a quantization principle. <coughs> well, in our case, gamma is periodic if and only if these two quantities are rational numbers. So in particular we have a circle and then we find also the connection with the, um, with the already known uh, results in the periodicity. Uh, to have an image of uh, what does it, how does it look like, if we think uh, of the um, S3 on the, on the three-dimensional sphere. There is an example of a periodic magnetic trajectory obtained by uh, Inoguchi and Montano, which was uh, plotted using the stereographic projection from the North Pole. Yeah. So this is the curve. And moreover, they show that it lies on a Hopf tube, which again, it is plotted using the, um, the stereographic projection. Uh, finally, about uh, magnetic curves in generalized Heisenberg group, um, we, we, we just said uh, the main results. So a generalized Heisenberg uh, group is, um, is a, another example of a quasi-Sasakian manifold. The magnetic curves here are slant curves and um, they are uh, helices of maximum of the five. Again, of the five. Yeah. Of course, the explicit parametrization, it's a um, really hard working job here. If you manage to do, you find them, all the components. Here is all you can get. You cannot get more than this. And what we think, yeah, we give it as a conjecture in the paper, is that uh, every contact magnetic curve in a quasi sasakian manifold of dimension greater or equal to five is a Fermi helix of maximum of the five. Um, we, we talk here about just a quasi sasakian manifold. What we obtained, the, the positive answers, which sustain this um, remark are the results obtained in R5 in R2n uh, uh, plus 1, so 2n plus 1 dimension, and the results I, uh, I presented today, so in the product type quasi Sasakian manifold Sasakian um, cross Keller, S3 cross S2, and the generalized Heisenberg group. For um, the three-dimensional case, this is really, really special. 
Uh, so if we have a quasi sasakian three manifold, uh, for example, if rank is one, we have cosymplectic. There are no quasi sasakian three manifolds with rank two, and for rank three, uh, we have just um, uh, it it uh, it has a rank three if and only if eta is uh, contactful. Example of cosymplectic three manifolds: E three S two cross R H two cross R, and these are studied. Uh, the eight model spa spaces from the first one list, um, they, uh, they are as follows. So, except for the hyperbolic three space and the uh, soil three, hyperbolic three space is um, again not a manifold, and uh, soil three is a non Sasakian contact metric three manifold. Uh, the, the rest of them, so E3, S3, S2 cross R, H2 cross R, uh, Heisenberg drop, uh, universal covering, they are quasi Sasakian. Uh, the magnetic curves in quasi Sasakian three manifolds was uh, done in collaboration with Professor Zenon Gucciamentano. Uh, again, we, we obtain that every contact magnetic curve on a quasi Sasakian three manifolds is slant. If one computes the curvature and torsion, we have only dimension three, so we have curvature and torsion. We notice that gamma has constant curvature, but the torsion depends on the function involved in the quasi Sasakian structure. This is a function here. So if for Sasaki we have, for Sasakian manifolds we have helices, here, if we have a quasi Sasakian three manifold, in general, we don't have helices. Yeah, so it's quite special, the, the three dimensional case. There is also an example that we, 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 we solved on um, a quasi Sasakian three, three manifold introduced by Velichko. And here, if we study the magnetic curves, we solve this system somehow and in the end we see that we have these components in general it's not a helix only in some uh, in, in some particular cases you can get helices and these are some um, some selected references of uh, some of the papers that I, uh, I used uh, so the papers together with my colleague and with uh, Professor Zinovici and Montano. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your interesting talk. Now, colleagues, if you have some questions or remarks, comments, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Are there any questions? Or do you want to add something? Maybe your co-author, Marianne Montano. I saw him as a participant at the beginning. I don't know whether he's in front of his computer now. I think he's involved in something, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, so. If there are no questions, so let's thank the speaker, Anna Irina Nistor, again. Thank you so much. And, uh, we can use this virtual clap. <laughs> thank you so much again, for sure. Thank you. The next talk will start at uh, half past 11. So, see you in 40 minutes again.